Hi, my name is Paul Rivera Jr. and this is Paul Rivera Sr. and we're here today doing a little podcast here. This is our second official podcast and I call it a podcast only because we're using this whole cool get up. Special thanks to Rode Microphones. Um, but today we're going to talk about these, these prototypes. This is a Fender two-channel preamp and a Fender power amp. They're both rack mountable. That's right. I know we did a video before back in the day talking a little bit about it, but I just wanted to kind of revisit this. And these were so ahead of its time. I mean, what, when you were in your, when you were at your Fender days, what, 1982, when did you design this? Well, the, the actual layout for these products came when I created the five-year plan for Fender in 1981. In fact, it was 40 years ago this month that I started wow. working on the plan for Fender, and these were in it. And the reason we did uh, wanted to do a rack series is because racks were still being used by touring bands, studio musicians, and so on. And while I knew these wouldn't be like huge mega sellers, we were designing these for the highest echelon of professional musicians. And they all had racks. I do remember as a kid when you were uh, modifying and repairing amps in the garage, a lot of these session guitarists bringing giant refrigerators, refrigerators of just exactly. massive rack gear. That's right. Yeah, their cartage companies would show up. They, they, you know, they right. didn't have the transport. The cartridge companies would bring them. And I think you would sometimes run a microphone and I would sneak in <laughs> with big delays <laughs> in these refrigerator racks. It was so fun. Anyways, um, I didn't know about that. Thanks for telling me now. <laughs> you know, I was eight. Yeah. Anyways, um, so back in the day, so and that, the, when you were doing that before Fender, back in the day. The That's right. Racks yeah, I was creating pedal boards and rack systems uh, starting about, you know, 1975. And so, anyway, these products came out of the dream of what would be a great amplifier system, rack mount system. Unfortunately, I was too honest when I worked at Fender, and I told them that was only going to sell a couple hundred units. And the accounting people weren't very happy. What, what do you mean, you know? And tell me a little bit about the uh, preamp. It's a two-channel clean, both clean channels? and you. Yeah, well, there's using... one channel with lots of headroom. There's another channel that has, uh, you know, distortion capabilities. But it has a very unique front end on it. It has a front end called an auto pad. And an auto pad basically attenuates high levels coming into it so that you can't overload the first tube sections. And it's never been done on a tube amp before. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's a little complicated of a of a preamp in that one section. Because that what we were having problems with was people running line level into the front end of the preamp and then overloading the very first tube stages. So like running a, let's say, an ADA preamp through the front in a way, yeah. and it was cranked. Yeah, the output right, was exactly. cranked on an ADA or something like that? Yeah, or whatever the, the pedals were at the time, or let's just say they went into a line-level pedal or a line-level rack effect and then came into this. I mean, you couldn't predict how the front end of this thing, of what it was going to see. So I came up with the idea of using an auto pad, which are actually used in PA mixers uh, as a topology, as a circuit topology, but nobody had ever done it with tubes before. So that's what we did on the front end of this. It has so many unique features that had never been done. Just look at the equalization on it. It has multiple mid bands on the equalization in a tube. I did notice rack that preamp in 1983. 1981. I drew this out. 1981. Yeah. Okay, so this preamp was. Two brand way ahead. Two channel preamp. There wasn't way anything. Ahead. There wasn't anything like it. And you know, if you'll notice, little features like that BNC connector on the front of it for the light. For the light. So right. if you've got a rack mount, you if you got a rack, you got to be able to see where your knobs are. And it's usually the roadie who's twisting the knobs, not the guitar player. It's interesting too, being in Los Angeles, dealing with these session pro guitarists. Clearly, you got to see real life. Oh, yeah. Situations. Absolutely. And that was the, you know, get interacting with uh, musicians is kind of the genesis of a lot of these ideas. Ooh, wouldn't that be cool? 
Right. And then when I would bounce ideas off a guitar player, they'd go, oh, my God, that's great. Yeah. I do bring up that point often. It must be hard if you're from a, in a small town and you don't have a lot of access oh, yeah. to. Your, your, your biggest guitarist is the guy that plays a local bar, and it's probably not the same situations, right? Different oh, size you know, a casual stuff. musician who's playing a club gig at the local, you know, Holiday Inn, he is not probably the right guy to use to design a bunch of new products because he's not on the cutting edge of music creation. Right, but your job with this is the professional but the aspiring guitarist that might start in sure. a small club. absolutely. Which brings me to the feature, and we've talked about it before on other amplifiers, the focus control. The focus control is a name penned by you. I've, it's yes. been copied on others, and I've seen it. Yeah. Um, that is almost like a room boom control, right? Correct. That's exactly what it was. So if you're in a small exactly bar, right. the stage is boomy, whatever, yeah. you're in the corner. Correct. Not only was it to tighten the speaker, but it was a room boom control. Am I yeah, wrong? Yeah, that's correct. Absolutely. Yeah, and the biggest problem is you're in some stages where it's a black hole for sound. And no matter what you do, you couldn't warm it up. It, there was enough bass absorption or what was going on or reflective sounds or who knows what. And so you wanted to be able to warm the tone up. And that was another reason for the focus control. Some say that doesn't really matter if there's a close-up mic which for front of house, which I can see that possible argument. But at the same time, if you're not happy with your tone on stage. Yes, correct. That's right. You're not inspired the same. You're yep. going to feel insecure and not yes. play as well. And that's the truth. Yeah. So the mid-range control in this preamp, the auto pad, the focus control, obviously you brought in a lot of features from Active back effects in the loops, day. all tube effects loops. The whole Paul Rivera topology. Yeah. It's in a, a lot preamp. of, correct. And then tell me about the power amp. You wanted a matching power amp. What about this well the power matching? Amp pa see the matching power amp. The idea behind the matching power amp is it needed to be bulletproof, which means it had monster transformers. It I had noticed. to be yeah, the transformers. I mean, you could use Massive. this as a boat anchor on a luxury liner. And yes, when it's in a rack, you expect things to be heavy, and it's not a problem to handle it. It was not like the musician was going to carry this the club kind of idea. I see four power tubes. Is this a hundred? It's a hundred and twenty watt. Hundred and twenty watt yeah. mono power mono. amp. That's correct. Now I know that these when you left Fender, you were thinking rack mount. Yes. Clearly. Correct. And the Rivera TBR series. That's right. Which were stereo preamp and power amp all in one. That's looked correct. very similar. Yes, that's right. So you went mono here, but through this, was it the trend of stereo, or what made you decide? Well, that we how had, did we get from here to TBRs? Well, the the world was stereo because everybody was going stereo on the effects, and obviously a power amp of this topology with monster transformers making it stereo that was really the challenge, and then putting the preamp inside of it was a great challenge. So that's how we integrated it into the TBR series because we got. All, all of the worlds together in a four-rack space panel. Rather than two mono yes, power amps and so correct. forth. Exactly. And that was yeah. the first, that was penciled in 1986 or? Uh, I left, well, here's what it is, is after I left Fender and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and should do, and I decided that this would be really cool as products, I actually penciled them out on napkins, penciled them out on paper, took a trip around the world to visit distributors in Europe and Japan and said, if I build this, will you buy it? And I came back with 100 orders, and I figured, well, I guess it's a good time to start manufacturing. I remember that. I was so young. I think we had a piece of land somewhere in Los Angeles Crest. Yeah, that we sold well, to fund Big it. Tonga Canyon. Big Tonga Canyon, something yeah. like that. That's We're right. going for it. Yep. There goes the size of my Christmas gifts. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> no, you got to solder circuit boards That's, on our dining yes, room table. I learned early Christmas 1985 because That's we were right. going to show them at uh, NAM on January of 1986. We unveiled the first TBR amplifiers to the world. 
I remember inhaling cider smoke at seven. That <laughs> explains why I'm a little crazy. All lead back then. Uh, no, you were so just a little older. Let's let's back up a little more. What, okay. What are these? The only ones in the world? Are there it's two? The only ones? Nope. Only ones in existence. The only preamp and the only paramp. I thought I heard there was two. Did that no, there not was make a it? preamp was that was a solid state preamp. Wow. There's a solid state version of this version of this that exists somewhere out there in the UK. In the UK. Yeah. Who got that? How? Uh, How do you remember? Uh, I'm not sure, but there was a guy that was handling artist relations in the UK for Fender. And we sent it over there for him to evaluate or give it to musicians to evaluate. And, you know, it kind of went. Poof. Wow. If any of you find this preamp, will you please call us at <laughs> 555-5555? Back to just production. So you told Fender, we're going to sell a couple hundred, which give us a relation to compared to the amount of tube amps they expected to sell. Back well, then. I mean, you know, we when I joined Fender, the sales of Fender amps were like 7,000 a year or something, some small number. I can't remember precisely. And 7,000 is small for them. For Fender, 7,000 amps a year was like barely able to keep. And they had a huge quality issues with a Mexican factory and so on. And so there was a lot going on all simultaneously. I mean, I have to just back up for a second. When I joined Fender 40 years ago, I, t I was mentioning something to Tom Beckman, who at the time had Beckman Musical Instruments and was the Roland distributor. He says, oh, you're going to Fender, are you? You know, they offered us the company for sale. They're just hiring you because they want to sell the company. Ha, 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 ha. Good luck. And I didn't want to hear that because I had all my enthusiasm of all the amp designs and so on. And this is as I was creating the five-year plan of how to get Fender back in the amp business. So I, like, blocked out everything Tom Beckman said. Of course, he was correct. Uh. They were really getting the company ready to sell, so they wanted to pump it up because their sales had gone in the toilet, the quality was in the toilet, they had so many quality control problems. It was, you know. Was this mostly in the electronic side or the guitars as well? Oh, guitars as well. They made the mistake of buying this painting system. I think it was called a Rens Rensselaer painting system. And they had nothing but problems. They were going to a water-based paint. Nobody had tested the fact that when you put a white body into a flight case that's like lined with orange... Okay. That it might bleed all the way into all the guitars. Ah. So they sent all these guitars out to the dealer. The dealers opened them up and went, what? And they had all these dealers come back, and they had pick guards that rusted. And, I mean, the quality problems were just, like, insane. Gosh, that sounded like what happened to my guitar when our German Shepherd peed on it. <laughs> just stained it, <laughs> rusted out. Anyways, what was the name of the painting system? <laughs> I, it, Ressler? you know, Rensler. Oh boy, that's going to be in the forums system. now. Was it uh, painted by a Rensler? I don't want no, that. No, it was, a, it was a, a terrible painting system and they had nothing but problems. You know, the biggest problem when CBS owned it was that some of the people that they hired that they thought could solve the problem, it was a huge corporation hiring these guys. There wasn't the personal connection between who they were hiring to like solve the paint issues and it was a corporation everybody gets their paycheck sure so sure. you know that, that it's is like that a whole be the different mentality right. if it if leo fender had been there you can bet your bippy that that painting system would have never even made it into the factory you right. know as uh as one of the oldest you know people that worked at fender told me that when CBS bought them, they hired guys from Ford to teach those country yokels in Fullerton how to make production. Yeah. And when they found out that, you know, the Ford guys said, well, hell, we don't fix stuff that's on the assembly line. We let our dealers do it. I think we've no, talked it's a, about it's that It's a common before. problem. Where there's plenty of corporations that run phenomenal companies that build phenomenal product, you know. But uh, usually there is a face and a leader. You know, yeah, when they don't exactly. have when it's leaderless, it is a little more difficult and challenging yes, because precisely. the communication yeah. gets filtered by I don't want to get fired and yes, exactly. why, what will this do and gain for me and 
But uh, when you see companies like uh, Taylor Guitars, when you have a Bob That's Taylor. That's a different, you have a Bob Taylor. You have a Bob Taylor or you have yeah. a Bory Smith. I mean, these guys really care about yeah. what they do. Exactly. And, uh, and, and it's, it's not reflected. Just, it's not just a brand. Right, right, right. Yeah. So either there's a guy there that bought it that's extremely passionate about it, which right. there's been yes. out there, or the, the originators. But Correct. So back to the TBRs. So, so 6,000, 200 pieces wasn't going to fly. Mm -mm. But so anyway, the five-year plan though was, you know, how do we get the production up to a hundred thousand? How do we get it to 125,000? Because then you could really see that you have budgets for artist relations and budgets for advertising budgets to, for the engineering, for the R and D lab to hire engineers, to be able to, you know, you have to get the sales up. 7,000 wasn't cutting it. I mean, nobody really wanted a twin reverb anymore that was designed a zillion years ago. Sure. You know, the the market had moved on. They didn't have anything fresh and new. It's amazing how it moves forward and then moves back. Nostalgia yeah, sales. That's you're correct. Like, oh, I want four million sounds digitally. Oh, uh, yeah. you know, actually, I just want four great ones, you know, but it goes back and forth all the time. I do remember a story of sneaking through production some wood yes, cabinets. Yes, that's some right. Oak yep. cabinets. I didn't ask for permission. How did you sneak I, that? And there was only 100 uh, out there? Okay, so what happened was is that Hoopston used to be an organ factory, the Hoopston, Illinois, or was part of the CBS thing, you know, go Branson organs. So what I figured I'd do is I thought, okay, let's do a special edition. I don't have to go through a big marketing presentation on it because I figured out how the system worked. So I flew to Hoopston, Illinois, and I said to, you know, the people there at Hoopston, there were some really wonderful people there. I said, yeah, we're going to come out with this real kind of special one. Do you guys think you can source a cabinet for it? Well, what do you got in mind? And I said, well, who built your organ cabinets? They were all beautiful wood cabinets. Okay. All right. So then I went to uh, the panel company that actually made the control panels, I just walked in, and they knew me because I'd worked on the Super Champ of the concert and all these things. And I said, well, we're going to do a special edition here, and we're going to do it on three models. Uh, and it's a very small volume, but uh, can you give me a quotation on that? Okay. So then I went to and got part numbers, and I had part numbers created for all the panels. I had part numbers created for the cabinets. I had a bill of materials made. Ah, bill of materials with part numbers. Guess what? I'm now launching it into the system because ah. I've got part numbers. I've got an assembly drawing. I've got everything I need. And, you know, nobody questioned it. And uh, so the knobs, we needed special knobs because the knobs and the grill cloth had to match. So I actually got samples of the grill cloth, took it over to the panel company, and I said, I need you to match the colors on the panel to this grill cloth. Okay, we can do that. Okay, so get me samples of it. So they got me samples. We went through a couple of iterations. Look at that. Miller Dial now is making the brown and cream panels because I got a part number purchasing ordered the purchase orders for it because i had an assembly drawing do you get what i'm saying i do is I, I had the whole system figured out how to sneak a product in now the pantone colors for those panels were they the same as the original brown ones they did or your own did you create your no own i created it based on a grill cloth because i wanted vintage cloth so we got that cream and brown cloth this is the same colors then You've We've been for rakes. And yes, Jake's exactly. That's got exactly it. So right. So there are 100 oak cabinets somewhere. Of yep. th remember, that was between Super Champs, Princeton's, and concerts. 100 of each? Or 100, 100 of each. Okay. For the whole world. Right. So, so we have a concert and a Super bolt. Champ. That's correct. That's we have a two th I have the original prototype Super Champ. I remember throwing a bunch of tubes in there when I was eight. So... Yeah, that would have been, sounds yeah, right. Yeah. So anyway, you came so in going, we, oh my God, you're going to blow the amp. I wanted to get a Princeton Woody, and there was one in R&D, and I offered to buy it 
right after they fired me. And they went, no way. So I don't even know what was, I mean, come was on. Was that Bill Schultz that fired you? No, it was, well, it was Kurt Hemmerich. And, you know, he was told to fire me by Bill Schultz, Got obviously. It. Right. But, so let's know. just talk anyway. about that real quick. So we, you know, that's we, history. We, because we're talking history and we're, we really wanted to focus on these, these products. But when you got fired, Fender was for sale. There was a power struggle. Correct. Bill Schultz wanted the company. You were working for Roger Ballmer. Roger Ballmer who also was, was trying to get boss. the company. That's correct. Both these guys were fighting. You're yeah. in the middle. You were probably jumping on the Roger Ballmer side? Of course. He was my boss and a great friend. Got it. So right. that was my political mistake. I became persona non grata because... You're on this guy's yeah, side. Yeah, I was on this guy's side, right? So anyway, I was pretty naive. But at the same time, there were people on our teams that pretended to be on Roger's side who were actually feeding information to the Bill Schultz side. So they could save their jobs. Ah, corporation politics. Oh, my God. Well so play. Machiavellian. Jeez. Unbelievable. Do anyway, have I any made the right decision. politics between us? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Since these products were made, and just to wrap this up, you know, how much you must have learned so much in 40 years of, or after this, what would this be? So this is 1980, you know, 81. I left Fender at the end of 84. The amount that you've learned about running a company, I mean, it's amazing oh, yeah. we're still here with the amount of the vendors constantly changing and parts being discontinued and being recontinued in here and that. So you know, it's our 35th anniversary. Of Rivera brand. Ampli Rivera yeah. Amplifiers. The, right, not Rivera RRD. No, not the Rivera, RRD, the Rivera Ampli Amplifiers, yes. Amplifiers, 1986, right. our first productions. Amazing. The amount that you've brought to the table back then and all continue to bring now is really exciting to see. It's a passion. It's a sideline. It is a it It's in our blood. It's a passion. You know? Absolutely. And I love being a part of it. Well, thank you so much. This was, uh, I guess, was we, like a, yeah, we'll do another one. All right. Very Thanks, cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. Thank you.